Compression is not about removing dynamics, it's about managing them. In the last video, we talked about EQ, equalization, how to achieve a balanced sound within a song and between different songs on an album, in terms of the overall levels of bass, middle, and treble, and the, the crucial role that that has in influencing the way that it sounds to us and how loud it sounds. In this video, we're going one step further and talking about balancing the dynamics of the song. So dynamics are the contrast between the loud and the quiet sections. If we say that something is very dynamic, there's a very big contrast between the loudest moments and the quietest moments. If something has limited or uh, restricted dynamics, there isn't much contrast, everything is much more on a level. And that could be a musical decision, or it could be to do with the mastering processing, because one of the things that happens when you try and push songs to much higher loudness levels in the mastering stage is that you reduce some of the dynamic contrast in the song. Now, lots of people think that I'm somehow anti-compression or anti-limiting because I talk about loudness and the loudness wars all the time and the fact that I think most music will benefit from having balanced dynamics. Couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, compression is an absolutely crucial part of a modern recorded sound in pretty much any popular genre you care to mention. I use it in mastering, I use it in recording and mixing as well. I think the difference is that compression in mastering has a different goal for me. When you're working in mixing, compression can be very creative, it can be very aggressive, it can completely transform sounds, it can be very blatant, it can be very obvious, and anything goes. You know, it's part of that creative process, it's part of making the song sound the way that it does. For me, that's not how it should work in mastering. My goal with compression in mastering is to be invisible. I don't want somebody to listen to a song and go, wow, listen to the amazing mastering compression on that. I want them to listen to a song and think, wow, that sounds fantastic, and it makes me want to laugh or cry or dance or, or sing, and have no idea what mastering processing was done. I want the, the dynamics control to be invisible to them. And I think also it's worth saying that I'm not suggesting that more dynamic is always better. There can be as big a problem with having too much in the way of dynamics as there is with too little. If, you, if there are too little dynamics in a song, things can sound kind of held in and squashed and, and lifeless or dull or even distorted and crushed in extreme examples. But if you have something that is too dynamic, then it's unlikely to work in the widest range of listening environments. Uh, you could have a situation where the chorus suddenly blasts out at you after listening to the verse and it feels too loud and uncomfortable to listen to. Or you're listening to the chorus and it sounds great, but then the verse drops down and kind of disappears. There's a whole range of different aspects to dynamics and the key to all of them, as with every stage in the mastering process, is balance. For me, dynamic processing, uh, as Anthony David from SSL said once, Compression is not about removing dynamics, it's about managing them. And the goal is to manage the dynamics to find the sweet spot where the song is loud enough, it is intense enough, it's full enough, but it also has enough dynamic contrast to move you emotionally and make you want to dance or laugh or cry, whatever that might be. So I've laid out a process in these videos of setting the level, setting the EQ and setting the compression and dynamics. Of course, you could use the EQ after the dynamics processing, after compression as well. That's absolutely valid. It has a slightly different effect. And I think this comes back to my goal for invisibility. If you have a compressor that's working very hard on the sound and then you apply EQ afterwards, it can make the compression even more obvious. Take, for example, a kick drum, a pounding kick drum that's pushing into a compressor. The whole mix is pulling back as that kick drum punches through. 
then perhaps after the compression you decide, well, that kick drum is a little bit too prominent. I want to EQ some of it out. You can apply EQ to correct for that. That will work. But then the, the pumping of the mix, the way that the mix pulls back when that kick drum hits every time, is going to be almost more obvious because there's going to be less kick drum there in the first place to make you realize why it's happening. So your ear can often pick up on the, the side effects, the artifacts of compression more if you don't have a balanced EQ going into the compressor. So certainly when you're starting out, my suggestion is get a balanced EQ first, then apply your dynamics processing. If you want to add some EQ afterwards, maybe to sweeten something up or, or just improve something, that can work well as well. But a balanced EQ to begin with going into the compression is essential. I think the other thing to say is that when I talk about compression in mastering, I'm talking about compression and limiting. I, when I was first trained, compression was much less common in mastering. It's often you would just apply EQ and limiting to achieve the results that you were looking for. But these days, compression in mastering is much more common. I think there are more tools available to us and it's more expected often. So I like to share the load between the compressor and the limiter because they're good at different things. Limiters are excellent at very cleanly controlling the transients, the short, sharp, spiky stuff at the beginnings of notes, like the initial attack on a drum or the clicky finger noise from a bass guitar or in a vocal sound. They can control those very well, but if you use them too aggressively and they start to cut into what I would call the body of the sound, like the notes of a bass guitar or the body of a drum sound or the, the, the tone of a vocal, they're very, very aggressive, and I find they almost always don't work as well. They, you end up with things sounding flat and lifeless very quickly. You can end up with some really unnatural kind of processing and even distortion uh, and a very fatiguing wearing sound. Whereas a compressor is great for doing that kind of task. You can use longer attack and release times and use much more gentle ratios to just gently hold the body of the sound in place to, to glue everything together nice and subtly. Now that won't deal with the transients at all, they're probably likely to go through almost untouched, but that's fine because we have the limiter afterwards which is perfectly designed for controlling those. So the combination of the two, they can complement each other in the way that they work and enable you to achieve much more invisible results, which, as I say, is an important goal for me using compression in mastering. And the song Widow that we've been using in these videos could be a perfect example of that. In fact, the compression might be so subtle that you maybe won't hear it immediately. Uh, let me play you a little bit of that and I'll um, bypass it for you so you can hear what it's doing. Then I'll explain what I'm trying to achieve with it. But you play with it. So as I say, the, the effect there is very subtle, and really it's more about feel than sound in this case. Basically, all the compressor is doing is just holding back the snare ever so slightly. Not the initial transient, because we've got quite a long attack time. We've got 75 millisecond attack time here, and quite a gentle ratio, just a 2 to 1 ratio. And you can see it's just doing 1 to 2 dBs of gain reduction, mostly only when the snare is active. And the benefit of that for me is that it just makes the song flow a little bit better. With it disabled, I feel like my focus is very much on the kick, snare, kick, snare. When it's enabled, I feel I can hear more of the 
the hi-hat rhythm, the pulse kind of flowing through the bar and carrying the music along. It just kind of has a little bit of gentle bounce. It just softens the impact of the drums there ever so slightly in a way that I like. And I think perhaps more importantly, musically for me, I feel without the compressor, the drums are almost taking away my attention from the vocal. And with the compressor there kind of just holding everything in a little bit, I feel like my attention really stays focused on the vocals. So let me play that again to you and see what you think. So as I say, very subtle. I don't think you're going to listen to the compressed version of that and, and pick up on the fact that there's extra compression in that. I mean, there's, there's plenty of compression happening in the mix already that Mike has used. So this is just that final little tweak to really help the, the song work best at the mastering stage, which is what this is all about. Now, the song Promises and Lies has a more clearly audible result from the compression. And I've also chosen to use a slightly different type of compression. On Widow, I've used a single band compressor, and this is just the standard compressor that's built into Wavelab. And of course, there's all kinds of different hardware or software compressors that I could have used, but just as with the EQ examples in this series, I really feel it ain't what you use, it's the way that you use it. I wanted to show you that you don't need fancy plugins to achieve a worthwhile improvement in mastering. Having said that, I have chosen to use the multiband compressor that's in Master Rig for Promises and Lies. Multiband compression is a little bit of a controversial topic in mastering. Some people swear by it, some people swear at it. Um, I actually think it can be very, very useful. I tend to use it in a very subtle way that is as much like single band compression as I can make it. So I tend to use only three bands. I have the same settings wherever possible in every band. I think one of the challenges of multiband processing in general is that when you have different settings in different bands, the results can get very unpredictable uh, very quickly and it can be horribly confusing. So you'll see I've got the same settings here. I've got 100 millisecond attack time, automatic release times, um, and a two to one ratio again. I think that's a good starting point when you're using compression in mastering. Uh, you saw that I tweaked the attack time on Widow. In this case, um, I'm sticking with the 100 millisecond attack time and the automatic release time here is working pretty well. So I'm comfortable with that. The benefit of the multiband processing is that the compression that's happening in the, the bass and the mid bands here won't affect the high frequencies. So it reduces any possible audible pumping effects that you might get, helping make the compression invisible, which again is my goal. So let's take a listen to this and see how it sounds. And immediately I've noticed that when I disable the compressor, the signal actually gets louder and that's because we don't have any makeup gain applied and the compressor is, is holding back a couple of the bands and the, the low and mid band where a lot of the musical energy is. So I need to tweak that up. Um, let's try not quite a dB. So that gives you a much fairer comparison with and without the compressor with that little adjustment made there. 
And I'm sure you can hear the difference. With the compressor disabled, those rhythm guitars are coming through much more strongly. A bit too strongly, in fact, I think. There's a, there's a risk that they sound a little bit honky or a little bit congested without the compression. So the compressor is working really nicely to glue things together and hold everything in proportion. Now, of course, those EQ choices are the final EQ choices. I'm not being able to show you in these videos the entire process of choosing the EQ, choosing the compression. So it kind of makes sense that if I take the compression out, the EQ choices won't sound quite right. But of course, I've been suggesting to you that you should apply the EQ first and then the compression. And you're probably thinking that's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. How do you know what to do first? And you're right. When you first add your EQ, you won't know what the final compression settings are. And when you add the compression, it will change the way the EQ sounds. But that's OK. This is still the most effective way to get started when you're getting to grips with this. First adjust the level of the song, then adjust the EQ, then apply some dynamics, you will then almost certainly have to go back and adjust the EQ to compensate for changes that the dynamics make to the sound. And then you just go back between the two until you come up with a balance that you're happy with. When you have enough experience, you will be able to listen to a song almost immediately and think, ah yes, I want this kind of dynamics processing and put it in place to begin with and make your EQ choices with that in place. And that's the most efficient way to work. But I do suggest that you work on EQ first and then compression as you experiment with these strategies that I'm suggesting to find something that works for you. So again, I feel like the compression here is invisible in the sense that you don't listen to it and think, wow, listen to the compression on that. It's just having a beneficial effect on the sound. I really like the way that I'm getting control of those low and mid bands without causing any pumping in the higher frequencies. So the crossover here is at about 3.5K. And that has a subtle tonal effect on the music. And I think gives it a nice kind of sweetness in this particular case. You know, we've got a big, aggressive, dense sound in the mix, and it's nice to let some of that top end air come through. So I'll just play that to you one more time. Another effect I like of the compression there is that, again, it's holding back the, the body, that beefy element of the snare, gently. I mean, we're only, you know, it's only 2.9 dBs max gain reduction here in this mid-range band that runs from 150 up to 3.5k, which is where a lot of the musical content of the signal is. But it's just holding back that really dense part of the snare nicely. It's helping the kick drum sound more solid and impactful. So yeah, I'm really happy with the result there. And we've got another type of compression again in use on the final example here, Another Day Calling, and that is no compression at all. Um, I do have the Master Rig processor here, but I don't have a compressor module. I'm just using EQ. Now, of course, that's not strictly true because all of these songs are going through the limiter, but it's working fairly lightly. You can see so far maximum gain reduction there is 2 dB. And because we've got the compression as well, that's only going to be working on the transients most of the time. By the way, you can see here the input level has gone above zero. I get quite a lot of questions about that. That's OK in a floating point processing environment, which I think all modern DAWs have these days. The only exception where you might want to watch out for levels above zero is if you have a plugin that models a piece of analog gear or you're using a piece of analog gear, in which case if you push the levels too high you might get some saturation that you didn't intend and if you're going out to analog gear you might get some clipping at the output. So you want to be careful in those cases, but for a purely digital workflow with no analog emulation 
it's fine to let the levels peak above zero. And you can see that the limiter here is holding them to minus one dB. Again, that's a, a number that we're going to talk about more in the final video. So the limiter is acting, but I didn't feel that any extra compression was needed for another day calling once I had the EQ in place. Having said that, there is in fact another type of compression happening and you can see that here, it's the automation. We already looked at this in video number three about loudness. You can see that I've actually tweaked the curve there. I had initially a straight line reduction in level there because my main focus was on balancing the, the first section of the song and the second part of the song. But I actually decided to put in an extra rapid reduction here. Let me just play you that so you can hear how it sounds. So there's quite a big increase in level there. I remember commenting in the video on loudness that perhaps some parts of it still stuck out too much. My decision was to even that out there. I mean, the difference there is only, uh, I think, half a dB. It's a dB. So a reduction there of a dB as the energy of the song steps up. I don't feel that that affects that feeling of the energy lifting, but it just uh, helps keep things in control and stop things getting too loud by the end there. And of course, we've still got an overall increase in gain. The energy still builds through this final section of the song. Um, but automation like this, which back in the day would have been fader riding, is in itself a form of compression. It's just that it involves no extra processing beyond the gain. So it's very, very clean. Um, even though the level has been lifted in this early part of the song, we're still only tickling the limiter. And this reduction here means that we've still got those fantastic dynamics that Mike has built into the song, but we don't have to have the end of the song slamming up into the limiter or heavily pushing compression, because I already feel the textures of this song are dense and full enough. And as I mentioned in the video on loudness, uh, back in the day when we were mastering, it was much more common to not use any compression at all. So I wanted to highlight that as another valid approach. So there you go. That's the decisions that I've made for these three songs. You may feel that the changes that I've made to Widow and uh, Promises and Lies were quite subtle, or maybe not. Um, but I think you'll find when you add all of them together, they do make for very worthwhile changes to the sound of the songs, and we'll take a look at that in the final video. So there you go, we're done, right? We've optimised the level, we've optimised the EQ, we've optimised the compression. The song is mastered, it's finished. Well, yes and no, because we're working in our software, in our DAW, now we have to get that file to the outside world. So it has to be either submitted for distribution or replication, uploaded somewhere, and there are a lot of questions we need to answer about that before we save the final file. Uh, should it be at its original high sample rate and bit depth, or are there different file settings that can ensure a more consistent results out there? We've got the loudness and the dynamics to where we feel they're sounding great for the material. How is that going to work with online streaming services? Are they going to reduce the loudness? Is that going to change the way that the song feels when we hear it in comparison to others? And what about metadata? Things like artist and song title information, all those extra bits of information that are needed when the song gets out there into the world and people start buying it, or at least listening to it. Uh, we're going to look at all of those topics in the final video in this series, which is next. And if you found these videos helpful, then I think you will love the PDF that I've created called the Home Mastering Guide. It's completely free. It's a simple six step process to help you release your music with complete confidence. It's a great companion to the videos in this series. It kind of brings everything together and goes into more depth on some topics and you can get your copy completely free at homemasteringguide.com. Please also subscribe to the Sound on Sound channel so that you get the other videos in this series and all the other great content that they are releasing. My name is Ian Shepherd. Thanks for listening.